and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm very delighted to be here, uh, both on sites and digitally and remotely for you uh, who are online. Uh, I'm uh, Daria Schmitta. I'm a professor uh, of software engineering. Uh, I work with uh, tech companies and not only uh, on uh, very different topics. Uh, I used to be an expert on distributed work and virtual ways of working before the pandemic, and the pandemic turned me into an expert on remote and hybrid working. So it gave me another life for my career. And before being in academia, I actually had a normal job, a real job, one would say, in industry. So I know what I'm talking about. I work with very exciting companies. I work uh, in companies uh, in Sweden uh, and in Norway and their sites around the world. Uh, among those companies, um, you can see Ericsson, Spotify, Sony, Nimway also. Sony is part of uh, uh, of uh, uh, creative and innovative uh, startup accelerator. Uh, Telenor, Storybrand, ABB, and so on. Uh, and uh, ever since the pandemic, we have followed very closely a number of companies and also the news. Uh, I think this is the topic where everybody in the room uh, and everybody who has a job and those who don't have a job have an opinion about. Should people come to the office or should they stay remotely working from home or maybe working from a summer uh, house? In Norway, it's very popular to work from a mountain cabin. Uh, and I think this uh, this is uh, the very makes my uh, research very valuable because I try to uh, look for data and evidence and bring it to the table of those uh, who hold discussions at the job place uh, or at home in the family. So what we see here is that the um, the distance war today is not only about uh, having an opinion, but aligning on one concrete strategy at the workplace. Uh, the Handelskammere, uh, Stockholm's Handelskammer, made the large research of employers uh, and asked them what, in reality, how many days a week people come to work and um, at the same time, how many days would they like people to come to work? And here we see a very interesting and a little bit surprising uh, finding for me that 28% of respondents want people full-time to return to the office. At the same time, the majority of people chose three days uh, to be in the office. And somehow we have to compensate uh, for the gap between these two figures and also understand whether we have to gravitate towards more uh, office-based or office-first strategies or more remote-first or somewhere in the middle, let's say, hybrid strategies. So these are the five different strategies that we see companies follow and implement. Um, and uh, to be honest, in the last four years, there has been a lot of... Um, a lot of experimentation and adjustments to the strategies. So companies uh, that used to be uh, to to have a certain uh, strategy, they have already changed their strategies uh, and experimented. So how can we decide what's good for just our company? What is the evidence or what is the type of knowledge we need to gather to make a right decision? Uh, let's go through five questions that uh, we have defined for companies to follow. And the first one is very, very simple. Are your employees able to carry out their work remotely? And here I would uh, like to focus on four different things. First of all, you can ask what type of tasks, work tasks people do. Are they more in, dependent on hardware tools, infrastructure, or customers? That's why people need to be on site and cannot work remotely. Or is it about individual tasks that everyone can do from wherever? Uh, or maybe your company works on collaborative team tasks that actually require on-site close communication. 
Uh, so this is one of the aspects. The other aspect is just physically, can we work remotely? Is there an infrastructure that supports access to different resources that are available in the company? Or communication tools, do we have enough rich communication tools and equipment like cameras, uh, good microphones uh, to be able to uh, seamlessly communicate with each other if that is necessary. And of course, suitable work setup. Uh, I guess everyone in the beginning of the pandemic has had some neck pain, uh, back pain, because we were sitting in kitchens, right? Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, someone who has uh, children have occupied the child's uh, rooms with very, very low tables. So we've all been there and we've all suffered. And a lot of people, a lot of companies have invested into home office equally as having the office uh, at work. Uh, and people have received a sum of money to uh, buy desks that are uh, raisable, for example, raising desks or to buy monitors, not to be looking into small screens, uh, laptop screens. Um, other uh, companies, we also see a big difference in uh, age. For example, more senior people with higher salaries, they have very comfortable workplaces at home. More junior people who maybe uh, use all their money to afford rent, they don't have very comfortable places and they really depend on the work, ergonomic workplace uh, at the job. And then, of course, last but not least, I think one of the fundamental questions is whether a person... Uh, is equipped with the knowledge and skills and experience to be working independently uh, from home or from a remote uh, location. And this is both ability to carry out work tasks, uh, under, just understanding what to do, but also without supervision. Uh, or you um, don't have maybe self-discipline. Uh, a lot of people I've talked to, maybe not a lot, but some people, they get so distracted when they work from home. They see the dirty dishes, they see the dirty laundry, they see some dust on the table. So they they get distracted. They get um, um, they mix their private life duties with the work duties, and that's why it's good for some of us to work remotely, and it's not good for some of us to work remotely. It's not for everybody, and it's uh, very important to understand uh, whether each individual uh, stands on this question. So the second question is, uh, of course, about priorities. If you as an employer want to have happy people, because we know that happy people produce good uh, outcome at work, then we need to understand uh, how to, what makes people happy. And let me show you some data here. These are the preferences for work location in 2022. This is the end of 2022, where we aggregated data from surveys in 14 different companies. And the blue colors indicate that people want to work more from the office and the more red colors from home. And one simple conclusion runs here. There is not a single company where everybody wants the same thing. So having one fits all strategy doesn't satisfy everybody. So there doesn't exist an easy way out of this situation. Um, ironically, Norwegian companies happen to be on the top of this list with more people wanting to work from home. And as a research, I have no answer to why is that. Maybe one speculation is that they have smaller companies. So smaller companies tend to work as more family businesses uh, where people have very close relationships, enjoy each other's uh, company and thus come to the office more often. But uh, to, uh, you can say this is old information. You should have updated your research, Dalia. And so I did. I will show you two recent examples of companies with employees choosing own on-site presence. So in Sweden, we don't, uh, and uh, in these particular companies, it's a 
uh, company A is a Norwegian company with a Swedish site as well, and company B is a Swedish company with some um, some people working from India uh, in an Indian office. Um, these companies don't count office presence and don't force compliance with the strategy. And one of them has a flexible, with one exception, rem fully remote is not an option. But people have freedom to decide how much they come to work. And the second company has a 50% during the whole year. So it's quite hard to understand what that means. It can mean uh, half, two, three days on site and remotely during the week. But it also can be two weeks fully on site and two weeks fully remote. So um, it's a little bit of uh, more flexible uh, strategy than it sounds um, in, in, on paper. And what you see here is a combination of current work arrangements, so how many days per week people come on site and how many would they like to come on site. And what we see here is that the majority of answers are on a diagonal, which means that you come to the office as much as you wish to come or as little as you wish to come. And this makes people happy. So when we ask these people whether they are happy with their work arrangement, more than 90% say that they are happy. So what do we learn from this? If we let people choose what they want, you will end up with people with very different patterns of office presence. Interestingly enough, the company that has very flexible strategy attracts more people on site. So you can see that 44% come four, five days a week. This is office first, heavily office first strategy. So I think that is one of the unexpected results in our research. What this company also does together with their flexible strategy, they believe that people are grown up adults responsible enough to make a good decision. But they are very clear that the office is their main place of work. They have renovated the offices. They have upgraded their canteen. Don't underestimate the value of the good food at work. We are um, now getting obsessed with eating healthy and eating good. Uh, and um, most companies, also Sony in Lund, has even negotiated the menu uh, to have some pancake Thursdays also to attract people uh, to the office. And this is very important. And we see it also in, uh, in our research. Company B has uh, implemented ice cream for free. First it was on Fridays, but now it's every day. It's not uh, anything special anymore, but uh, but it's quite uh, quite interesting. Another anecdote I can say that uh, um, yet another company uh, has um, introduced lunch and learn seminars where they buy um, cannelbulle, uh, cinnamon buns. And the cinnamon bun, think about it, it costs, what, 15, 20 crowns. It's very cheap. But people commute to work to get it for free. <laughs> so it's uh, it's quite ironic how little it takes to lure people into the office. But we don't always know what's good for us, right? So when when, when you let people uh, decide uh, how, how much to come to the office, they might uh, decide out of their habit. Mm -hmm. And we carry a lot of legacy from the pandemic. We work from home out of habit. Uh, and uh, there, there is research speaking against it, that the high degree of remote isolated work from home is not good for us as human beings. One of them is here. We have asked in these two companies, this is very recent data, by the way, um, one research in company A was carried out uh, last June and company B this year's June before the summer. And what we see is that half and more than half of the respondents say on days when they work from home, they work more than eight hours. 
because the boundary between the work and life is blurred. You cannot close the door and walk home and say, there is no spillover from work to my private life. It's very hard to be disciplined and really uh, have the boundaries introduced at home. That's why uh, one of the aspects that people talk about in relation to well-being is the uh, potential burnout effect when people work in isolation four or five days away a week from home and work more than they should. And let's face the truth, the routines, the very routines, daily routines on days when we work in the office and on days when we work from home are very different. So some people I've talked to uh, say they don't shower, they wear pajamas at least until midday, they eat uh, not on regular hours, they hardly communicate, they have very focused work and that's one of the core benefits. Uh, however, uh, if you do it one or two days a week, that's fine. If you do it five days a week, it might not be that good for us. And to show you uh, a little bit uh, about this, um, yes, work well-being topic, it is very clear in our research that there are people who choose to have work-life integration where private errands are put into the daily routine inside in the middle of the day, in the morning, after lunch, instead of lunch, in the afternoon. Here you have darker color, doctor's appointment, lunch and gym, pick up flowers, physiotherapy, daycare, uh, gym, car service, and, and so on. Um, and there are also people who come four or five days a week to the office to segregate the, the, the life and the work, the private life and the work life. So these are people who don't want the integration of, um, of things in the middle. Uh, yes, and one fundamental question in this discussion about what's good for us it's also a fight of ego before we go, or should it be vice versa? Should we put group and team needs before our individual needs? So some of the companies that highly depend on collaboration, they actually encourage teams to have dialogues and discussions about each other's needs of others' presence in the office. So if I'm more senior person, I know what to do. I have experience, skills, discipline. I have a good work uh, ergonomics at home. I should not only think about if I need others, but if I'm needed by others at work. Maybe I have a mentee. Maybe I have a junior team members who want to learn from more senior people. So it's not only about what I want, it's about what the group needs. And I wish to say that the sum of individual, the, the, the teamwork, the outcome of the team effort is much bigger than the sum of individual contributions. We have lived in the era where we have employed a lot of brilliant people who are introverts, at least in tech companies, introverted, brilliant developers who cannot talk to each other. And we have moved to more agile ways of working, team-oriented, collaboration-oriented. And our recruitment strategies have also changed to employing people, 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 people type of uh, social beings who like to work and collaborate in a team. And I think we will lose that if we go and focus only on me, 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 what I want. So the question, the follow-up question on this issue is what defines your organizational culture? 
Is it about individuals working in a company or is it about collaboration? Also, is it about autocratic uh, leadership style with a supervision or is it about self-management and autonomy? So depending on a leadership style and a need and focus on collaboration, you can also change and adjust your strategy. So moving on, there is also uh, one important aspect uh, dependent on companies, on networks and social capital. I think nowadays we are in transition because we live with the legacy of pre-pandemic times. Most of us have had the same job before 2020. Most of us, not all of us, obviously, we have young colleagues here in the audience uh, that started um, a few uh, weeks or a few months ago. Uh, but most of us know each other and we live on the experience not expense, but thanks to, we survive thanks to the network that has been established before the pandemic. Let's imagine ourselves 10 years from now, when most of the senior guys will retire in the company. I work with one company where the average age of employees is over 50. Imagine in 10, 15 years, most of them will retire. So, we need to integrate young people into the social networks because social networks is what makes us efficient at work. It's knowing who is who, it's knowing who knows what, who is where, and who does what. Because a lot of things where we depend on each other are done through social contracts, through negotiations. We can speed up so much knowing other people. So corporate contact network is very important. But what we see is that with the remote, the high degree of remote working, there is a poor social integration of new hires. The networks become static, which means that we talk to the same people we used to talk before and we have more silos. And let me illustrate this with a more recent survey findings where, there, uh, where the uh, degree of individual office presence is combined with the ability to build relationships at work. We have asked several questions. Chances to get to know other people, people taking a personal interest in you, feeling connected with teammates and belonging to the team. And we can clearly see that People who come one, two days to the office, they have the lowest answers, responses here. And people who come less than one day a week, I think that they are higher, not only because they are fewer, but maybe because if you don't have any regular office presence, you start coping with this absence of office presence in a different way, radically different way. Uh, so... Uh, I think that my research doesn't show that fully remote cannot function. It can, but it requires a completely different organizational culture. And if this is the way the company goes, you need to relaunch the organizational culture, relaunch the way you integrate people into the social network and how you activate this social network. The second point here is the less you work on site, the less you are aware of what others are doing. And here is another example. This time, I combine it with team co-presence because the, uh, uh, the questions we ask here is about the awareness of the work of team members from the same local site and uh, knowing what team members from other sites are doing and members of other teams in the same location. So uh, we clearly see that those who don't have regular office presence, they score the lowest here. And the reason for this is that even if you have coping mechanisms to keep in touch with the 
team members, immediate team members, the horizon of your network becomes your team. It takes more office days on site to have this spontaneous being introduced to other people outside of your immediate communication network. The last of the five questions is whether employee-driven innovation is critical for your company. And uh, to be honest, most of companies ask me about this and there is a limited answer I can give because measuring innovation is very difficult. If you ask a company, how much innovation did you produce before the pandemic when everybody was on site and how much do you do now? it's very hard to measure. So one of the things that we measure are creative meetings and how they are carried out. Um, and here I want to bring up the topic of digital meeting fatigue. I mean, everyone knows how we log off mentally, cognitively from meetings that last more than one hour. Digital meetings are tough. If nobody uses the camera, it's so easy to just drift away and start daydreaming, thinking about something, checking emails or, or writing emails. So you multitask a lot when you're involved in meetings. Now, if these meetings are creative meetings, this is really bad news. And let me drive you through a typical creative and brainstorming meeting. In a brainstorming meeting, we want to generate as many ideas as freely as possible and not limit this uh, brainstorming um, ideation process. And in a digital meeting, to make sure we finish on time, we usually, what do we do? We bring ideas prepared to the meeting. So we skip the wide ideation already from the start. Now, what do we do next? Um, in, the comp in, in the same room, what we do usually in a discussion that we talk over each other. There is a lot of people involved in the discussion and talking at the same time, perhaps as well. In a digital meeting, first of all, people have to take turns. Somebody has to moderate who speaks now, who speaks next. And in a hybrid meeting, it's even uh, worse because remote people are second-class citizens uh, and they have very slim chances of participating in a discussion. And then, of course, not everybody is um, comfortable with this taking turns and speaking uh, up in digital meetings. So the amount of discussion is also much smaller. But then somewhere in the middle or towards the end, when we want to converge, we get hit by the fatigue. We get so tired that everybody thinks, okay, let's pick the least worst idea or the best idea of the ones that we have discussed so far and just go on. So I think that one of the wonderful things with the Swedish culture is consensus driven decision making. And this means that everybody in the room needs to be convinced that this is the best idea. This uh, minimizes the rework. The more we plan, the more we ideate, the smaller the chances that we will fail somewhere down the line. So this is the blessing and the curse of the Swedish culture. And I think this um, digital brainstorming kills that culture because we are inclined to set to the best at the moment to finish on time because we also become much less available for planning follow-up meetings our calendars are full the more we work remotely the more full our calendars are with um maybe 30 minutes time slot booked with someone to discuss something that we could solve in five minutes on site. So for those who are interested in the question of where are we heading, we're not heading to fully on-site work because hybrid is our future. 
we will have to combine the in-office and remote working. The question is, how do we moderate that? And one of the things that we clearly see in our research is that individual pushing for individual office presence doesn't make any sense. In the morning here, uh, while grabbing a coffee, we have been discussing that people who come to the office and see nobody, empty offices, they come less, 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 and then they don't come at all. And I think the policies uh, that are now being discussed in companies should really target co-presence and not simply office presence. Here on the slide, you see four different teams in a company that has individual office presence as uh, the target. And you can see the thicker the lines, the more people are co-present on the same days. And the thinner the lines, the less you are in the office together. So what we see here is that there can be parts of the team that come on the different day days than other parts of the same team. So co-presence is what we want to encourage if collaboration, of course, is important. And a lot of companies now invest into a workplace that also supports the collaborative culture. It can be uh, activity-based architecture. It can be uh, open landscape to uh, deal with the lower office presence than the 100 or 70 percent. So we need to make adjustments, but this adjustment should really go hand in hand with the culture. And I think what we learned this morning about Nimway system was very interesting, that you can, uh, using the apps, Nimway apps, you can also see who is present and where they are sitting. And the companies I work with, uh, many companies, they either want, not the company management, but the people who are doing the work, they either want to sit, have team dedicated areas or want to know where people sit to be able to book desks together. Because let's say uh, you have a mandatory office presence, you force someone to commute to work and then they sit with someone they don't know. Uh, that is not very motivating people. And to illustrate, uh, making a small illustration, uh, I come from Kalskruna and uh, just a few weeks ago, Telenor in Kalskruna has opened their new offices. They have downsized their office space, but they also uh, moved into more uh, office-oriented working with uh, two days working from home and three days working in the office. And they have uh, made a fantastic job um, you can actually see that it's a campus on the seaside. It's uh, maybe as, not as fantastic and long as overseeing view as Sony, but it's also a fantastic view that uh, drives some people to work from the office. And it has opened up with more uh, socialization spaces and meeting corners and being more attractive as opposed to some um, offices that are quite boring to, to commute to. And with this, I will leave some uh, minutes for questions, and I thank you for your attention. Uh, uh, one thing I want a uh, question was that the awareness of what other are doing, and there were people that... Uh, were low attendance in office, didn't know what I guess we're doing. So the question is more, would they, would they need to know more or is it that some people don't care that much? Uh, I do this. And uh, so do you have any any ideas on... Yes. Is it, that's why they are... I, I don't... I'm not interested or I'm very individual working. I don't need to go to the office. There. So is there any... Yeah. There is definitely an association here, a relationship. So what we see is that we have also created, uh, based on statistical tests, profiles. Who are those people who come for five days a week, a week to the office? And who are those people who stay 
uh, working from home most of the days. And what we see is those who are in the office more, they do collaborative work. They have others depending on them. Those who are more working from home, they have individual tasks. The problem here is that this is more a reaction than a strategy. A lot of uh, these individual tasks are, first of all, because we learned to divide work so well during the pandemic out of need that we proceed with that behavior. And what I hear from people is that uh, when the, the, we develop very deep specialization and very little redundancy of knowledge. So individuals and team do a very diverse, uh, different tasks than each other. We cannot have backup behavior. If I'm sick, nobody else in the team can do what I do. And this is a problem because we see people who are sick who are working from home. And the second thing is that um, we started recruiting people on a distance. So if there is a manager who, who distributes the work, he or she picks individual tasks and gives to those people who are working remotely. And this is another behavior that is radically different from the behaviors that we had pre-pandemic. Whether it is good, in some cases it might, but I, in tech companies, um, joint effort is better than one person's contributions, individual contribution. So I think that in some companies it can be beneficial, in others it can be really harm the dynamic at the workplace. Should the chat? Yes. And Elias is asking, when it comes to the actual office, the space, what's the experience? Is that a good summary? Have the space twice the experience. What does that really mean? If you should ask and just to verify. There is another one. Uh, Good morning. Thanks for the presentation. Do you see a difference between industries, occupational groups regarding preferences for coming into the office? Yes, definitely. So uh, one of the interesting work that we have done is that we have followed up the uh, hype question. Are women more affected by the return to the office policies than men? And we see that it's not true. So if you put all men and all women, we have this one of the surveys with the 924 respondents. It's broad survey in the whole company doing, they have a software development department, but they also have HR people answering the survey, administration management answering the survey. And uh, if you put everyone in one bowl and shake it, then you get statistically significant differences between what women want and what men want. If you distribute and stratify the analysis by department, meaning by the type of work people do, then you will see that women in tech are like men in tech. And then women in administration are like men in administration, but different to women and men in tech. So we are similar in what we prefer and what we do uh, than we think. And to me, the big answer is the job. The job is central to understanding how much should I or should I not come to the office. I question then. Uh, you mentioned that, uh, for example, having ice cream or food in the office is a good magnet. Uh, do you have any uh, either research or like an uh, educative guess of? What what companies are using to get people back in the office? Like I've heard a company uh, hiring puppies and they'll come to their office, but the employees will come to play with the puppies. <laughs> but then I've also heard that uh, like in the UK, people are just coming to for the breakfast and then leaving to go back home again. So it's like you know what what actually works. I actually think that the one breakfast is a very low expense to build network. It's enough for networking. So I have encouraged, it's not just about coming for a full day at work or staying a full day at home. 
uh, we clearly see that uh, we don't do just collaborative tasks or just individual tasks. We have a mixture of different uh, duties. So do collaboration on site and then go home for three hours of uh, uninterrupted individual work with more reporting or documentation. So we don't need to choose just to be in the office or just at home. We can also mix it. And I um, I encourage some people to come f- to have lunch and one meeting. Uh, as little as that is enough to compensate for the lack of in- human interaction. Um, yes, uh, uh, speaking about different uh, things that attract people uh, to the office, we, of course, see that food... Really good coffee is one of the magnets, other magnets. Having a good coffee machine is worth it. Some companies have barista, uh, full-time barista that is preparing coffee. That is also a good magnet. Um, Gaming in tech companies, we see uh, they have gaming rooms and people after work, they spend a lot of time. Because in, especially in big cities and in multinational companies with a lot of expats, you don't have a big social network uh, beside the workplace. So you socialize at work. And then to socialize, you can provide a gym at work. You can provide gaming rooms at work. You can also encourage different sport competitions. Tennis, table tennis is one of the things that is popular in Sweden or billiards. Um, having those uh, attractive options at work, how to spend uh, free time is very uh, important. And of course, uh, maybe not bringing uh, puppies uh, because I don't know, it's not, it doesn't sound very sustainable where these puppies go afterwards. But uh, I have heard that some companies allowed the pandemic dogs in the office. And so you can bring your own puppy or your own dog and spend time on site. This is one of the things that I indeed heard. You've offered um, five questions. Who would you advise to ask themselves in Um Good question. I think it uh, it goes from the first person on the ground to the first person on top of the organization. Uh, a lot of... Uh, so let's imagine... Um, I ask, what is the culture of my organization? It's not a question only reserved to the higher management. It's also about my responsibility because we also make the culture. It's us. The culture is in the walls. The culture is among the people. Uh, So I think that is one of the toughest questions out of five. And uh, I think that you, uh, we have also tried to coach teams to discuss a lot of these questions together. Uh, We uh, have uh, meetings with line managers because they are squeezed in the middle between me, 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 what individuals want, and the higher management who sets the strategy and says mandatory presence of three days a week from 1st of October. And they need to implement and convince people that this is a good uh, decision. And then also the top managers who make these policies, uh, they are the ones uh, who can, through the dialogue and understanding the priorities, because if you ask a company whether they want happy people, everybody would say, of course we do. But is that the first priority? Can we let everybody, let's say you want, uh, you have a company with more red guys than the blue guys in in this uh, spectrum of uh, the five policies. Is that good for the business? I mean, happy people alone do not drive the revenues, do not create the products and uh, deliver the services. We also need other triggers uh, and other mechanisms to make people work together and uh, contribute to what the company is set to do. We have a clarification from Andrea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes. Uh, without everyone at the office, you probably do not need all the space. Is it not a good idea to use the money you save 
to make the office a better experience? You mentioned good food, coffee, techniques, etc. Uh, yes, it's a very good uh, question. And it is so, definitely. We don't need 100% unless uh you know i've seen several companies who downsize uh have half of the space they make it really really nice and then more people want to come and then they don't have the place so it's a, it's a little bit of catch 22 you need to first decide whether people in the office are important or not and then build the story and the offering around it i also seen um companies that say it is important office is important if we want to bring people back and then oh by the way we don't have a parking place for free anymore so these things need to go hand in hand uh, and uh, as attractive as it can sound to save money on real estate you need to be smart about it you cannot uh, make people feel unwanted in the office uh, if um, if that's your strategy. Another question, can you uh, Get people back to the office with a purpose. Do you believe that it is helpful to know upfront when your connected colleagues are going to the office so you go more with a purpose to collaborate or create? Yes, definitely. Uh, I think this is uh, very clear in our research and uh, we have followed up companies who have the is they don't have Nimway, uh, but they used to have Google Sheets where everyone could report where they are coming. And we could see that on days where you already have a lot of people, more people come on the same day. So they register themselves in the morning when they see who is in the office. Maybe they also see what the weather is like, uh, whether a forecast actually correlates with office presence as well nowadays. We have a question from Alpha. Some organizations tell us that measuring occupancy and second coordinate and manage bookings on the floor prevent conflict between employees. It's, is it not necessary that they can manage without as they always did? Uh, they seen as a necessary cost instead of investment. How do you see this? Is it nice to when and when is it a must-have? Uh, what has changed or not? Um, very difficult to understand, but let me translate it a little bit as uh, uh, to the best of my understanding. Uh, the conflicts, if we don't uh, talk about interpersonal conflicts, but the conflicts of rushing into the office and not finding the place, of course, occupancy is very important. In fact, there are uh, companies that also have shifts so, for example, some teams use the team space. The team spaces are for booking. And some teams can book the space for two days a week. And other teams can book the same space for two other days a week. So this is a very important tool if you downsize the office and you don't expect everyone to come five days a week. You can't really uh, avoid conflicts without measuring occupancy. Last question from Dorte. Uh, do company is consider the green agenda in relation to their current needs of desk and space? Absolutely. Uh, I think uh, one of the reasons why people justify uh, working remotely is the lack of commute and pollution associated with that. Unfortunately, it has to have a uh, go hand in hand with also smart office usage. So, for example, uh, one of the companies that we work with has uh, down, not downsized, but it decreased the maintenance of their offices on Mondays and Fridays because they know that uh, office building is not occupied all day. So they can close floors on certain days. They, can, uh, they don't need lighting and electricity uh, running on those days for offices that might be used by two people uh, instead of 50 people. Uh, they don't have maintenance uh, maintenance in terms of cleaning services. 
Uh, so this is one of the smart ways that definitely contributes uh, to sustainability. Yes, thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.